Hello and welcome to another episode of the Wannabe Entrepreneur, the podcast about what's really like to bootstrap a company. And today we are here with Marie Martens. Hey Marie, everything good with you? Hi Tiago. Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for uh, accepting the invite to speak with uh, Wannabe Entrepreneurs. Marie is the founder of uh, Tally together with her partner uh, Philip and Tally is basically, from my side at least, is the best form builder for indie hackers. I, I started using it uh, actually quite recently, even though I heard this name quite often and I love it. It's so easy and it's, it's a great tool for any indie hacker because when you're starting a business, of course, you want to both get the data from your users in a nice, beautiful way. And you also want to collect payments. And one great thing, one great feature that I love about Tally is the fact that we can just embed a Stripe payment form. And it's really it's really great. And I've, I've used it many times just to bootstrap something because do the Stripe, in, the Stripe integration ourselves it takes a lot of time. Marie is uh, already an expert in podcasts. You are in the Indie Hackers <laughs> podcast, in the Indie Bytes, in the Kevon's podcast, and I don't know, probably many, many more. It's nothing new for you, Marie, but we'll be speaking about your journey building Tally. And uh, you're also a mom. So I'm super also excited and interested in knowing how having uh, a doctor really changed the dynamic of being an indie hacker and everything behind it. So I think this will be a really, really interesting conversation. Do a short introduction about yourself and about your background before building Tally. Yeah, thanks so much for that the great introduction. I'm Marie, a co-founder of Tally. I founded Tally in the summer of 2020 together with Philip. Uh, Philip is my technical co-founder, but also partner uh, in life. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm also uh, a mother. So we uh, we had our first daughter in actually the same year as we founded uh, Tally. Uh, so that wow. has a uh, has, has changed a lot for us, for sure, but we can go into that uh, later. Yeah, I have a background in mainly B2B marketing. So I worked at some smaller and bigger companies in Belgium, but um, always in tech. And Philip, his background is he has founded other startups and he's a full mm -hmm. stack uh, developer. The latest startup was Delta. It's a crypto portfolio tracker app. So something completely different uh, that got acquired. Um, and that also helped us to start our own startup journey um, mm. with Tally. So that's uh, just a bit about me. You have the perfect team, it seems, right? Because <laughs> when, when you start a company, there's two main challenges, which is one is the tech side, you know, building right. the product itself. And the other is the marketing side. I know everyone is always running. I don't know if you know, for instance, uh, Dagobert is always joking around <laughs> uh, marketing and how marketing is something that everyone is avoiding. But you have that background. Yeah. Tell me, what have you done before? What, what kind of uh, companies you work for? And uh, what have you learned in, in this area of marketing that you were able to use now? with with Tally. I, I think the most relevant experience was my last job uh, before mm -hmm. I before we started our startup journey. Um, so I was a marketing manager at a digital product studio. So it's basically an agency in Belgium that develops okay. software for so digital products for other clients um, in retail finance um, and so on. So there would be I was responsible for the B2B marketing. So making sure that decision makers in the country know about us when they want to develop a, a digital product, have it designed and engineered, I have a lot of designers and developers as, as my colleagues. So I guess what I learned there is I would say a lot about, about product development, about shipping things fast, you know, trying to, mm -hmm. to keep the cycle small and, and ship it and tweak it, try to get something functional on the market and then improve it. So that that's something right. that was very um present there. We were organizing a lot of events, for example, which is something that is less relevant in in, uh, in my job now. But definitely the branding X aspect, the storytelling, you know, the, the fact that um, uh, your, your brand is as important as, as the product. Of course, the product mm. uh, needs to needs to work great. Otherwise, no one is going to use it. Uh, but the story right. around it. And I would say the main takeaway would be uh, 
the importance of content marketing. So for us, something that we're doing at Tally a lot is we're trying to write, we're trying to share our journey. Mm -hmm. We're trying to, re to create relevant content for our target audience, which is usually also startup founders. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also something that differentiates us a bit from the bigger players. Of course, everyone is creating content, but our story is a, a bit different as indie hackers right. and a small team. So yeah, I yeah. think those are like the main uh, main things. There's there's a lot more, but I would say those are the main uh, main learnings that, that kind of okay. help me uh, growing Tally right now. Mm -hmm. To summarize, you, you spoke about great content, which is uh, yeah something really important for SEO reasons, for, for yeah. instance, and, and to help people connect. Uh, you spoke about organ organizing events, which is maybe not that as relevant for now, but it's also something interesting. You know, it's something that yeah. helps with the brand awareness and 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 to yeah. connect with people. And you also spoke about something that I found really interesting, which is the fact that you understand the cycle of releasing a product, a tech product. And right. often when I when I worked, I, I worked for instance in a company in the in the travel industry, which I know it's an industry that you that you like uh which called it's called Truvago. And okay. uh and this company, um by the way, which it's in Dusseldorf, which I, I've seen that you also organized some I checked your LinkedIn profile like a stalker. And I, I saw that you organized some events in Dusseldorf. Is that true? Um no. uh, that would yeah for my internship actually. Yeah yeah, yeah. that's that's like way back but it's true. <laughs> uh, so you, you visit the city? I've been there. I've been there but it's it's yeah. been more than 10 years yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I lived there for for a few years, and I was like, oh, hey. every time I see Dusseldorf, it, it's such a, a known interest, interesting city. It's it's a good city to live in, but it's not like like Ghent, for instance, where you live now, or or yeah. Paris, or or Lisbon. So every time I see someone living in or that not living, but that as Dusseldorf somehow connected to them, I was like, oh, super cool, Dusseldorf. <laughs> um, anyways, you know how to release how the release cycle works. And I remember in Trivago, for instance, we always have this problem with marketeers where sometimes marketeers would come up with features and put these new features in their ads, even though these features were not ready. Uh, right. Yeah. So is this something that, you, that you've <laughs> seen, for instance, in other companies that like there was a disconnection between the marketing department and the development department? Not really, because, um, yeah, I would say... At my previous job, we would develop a software for other clients, right? So we would not do the marketing for them. So that was not really a thing. But like, for example, at Tally, we're only two people. So there's not really a, a, a division between marketing and engineering. Right. It all blends right. in one, right? Because our new product features are like super interesting marketing-wise because that's what we talk about and it gets our right. users excited. So that that would not happen with us. But I do know that is the case in a lot of a lot of bigger product companies that there's mm. like this real um disconnect between marketing and, and engineering yeah. and it it's weird right because it should be i mean it should be like a one-on-one -on -one type of thing it should yeah <laughs> i think for us what really helps me is that i was until recently also doing a big part of a customer support so i would hear everything that is being requested so I would also right. know, like, okay, it makes sense to develop this now or to write an article about this or this feature because uh -huh. it is what is being what is wanted, you know. So there's not at all a disconnect between what marketing would do and and what the users would right. request or what what my partner then uh, Philip would uh, would engineer. Um, so I guess that's what I like about being such a small team is that. We're too small to have disconnects, you know, right. because there's no boundaries. But it, I can imagine that it's a big challenge to to keep it like that when you grow, for sure. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. When you are an entrepreneur, you and you build your own company, you're so much more connected yeah. with the success and of the company and how the product works and and how the yeah you're connected to the users that you, it's easy for you to understand how how crucial it is to have marketing and development connected. Tell me about your uh, your background as an entrepreneur, because I, I quite often see that entrepreneurship is something that like, comes from early on. A lot of people that are entrepreneurs that I've interviewed in the podcast, they've tried many things before. Or they always had like this kind of passion for entrepreneurship or starting something. Is it the same for you? 
I would say mine is a bit different. So I would say like my um, my partner would be the classic example of that. Like since okay. he was a student, he's been trying pr out projects and launching different things. Many failed uh, and, and some of them succeeded. So he definitely got like this, this, this passion from very early on to just build things and um but not necessarily to like sell them uh so it would often you know stop at just like building it and then right. nothing would really happen anymore um, at least with the with the younger uh, the earlier projects that he did mm -hmm. for me um i've always enjoyed creating things and starting new things uh, but i've never had a uh, Really, I mean, I've always been able to do that in my job as well because I work like at, okay. at, at cool company, yeah. uh, and yeah. I and I got the liberty to do that within my job. But for me, I guess I really needed some convincing to just quit my job and go like all out for entrepreneurship, um, you know, without having any safety or or security, yeah. especially financially. So I guess our story might be a bit different as in we were a bit older probably than the average startup founder when we mm -hmm. when we started our first startup, which was not Tally but Hotspot. We were, you know, I guess 30, 32 or something. So we had worked mm -hmm. for around 10 years, also had saved um, some money. So we yeah. had like a runway, which is, I think, quite important uh, or at least Definitely. it was important for us to be sure that we could pay our bills at least for like a year or a bit longer uh, if we would not make money. Um, so it would not put too much pressure on us, like the financial side. And I've always wanted to travel and like have the whole digital nomad lifestyle. So all of that kind of came together in the beginning of 2020 when we just decided to travel and try our first startup, which is Hotspot. It, it's something else uh, than Tally in a different space. Um, it was a marketplace right. that connects travel influencers with hotels and kind of enables like... Um, smaller hotel owners to work with with influencers and promote their, their places so our idea was to travel while building this um, we already had like an mvp we had some first paying customers so we had like an idea of this might become something right. and you did you know the space before like, no did you work in no <laughs> no okay. not at all so that that might have been a number one mistake uh, we're, we're very interested but we definitely don't know the space i mean we like to travel and it, it stops there yeah. we don't know anything about the hotel uh, hospitality industry so mm -hmm. uh no of course uh, yeah the, the the adventure didn't last very long because of covid right um, yeah so we kind of the traveling we had to return after one week uh, one month later, you know, pandemic, the whole travel industry was down. I, I definitely know that because I was in the same situation. I was working in a small startup in the travel industry. Okay. And uh, from one day to the other, like literally everything stopped. Yeah. You know, yeah. we we were having our best, we were like growing, a growing startup. We were having the best numbers ever in okay. I think January or February, I don't remember. But oh, then the wow. next month, everything March. went to zero. And the... <laughs> It's 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 yeah. It's definitely the the COVID, the COVID definitely changed. I guess both of our lives. But I'm also interested, like how this this conversation goes. So you you like to be creative, but you don't like maybe or necessarily enjoy taking this kind of risk of okay, let's let's quit my job and and go full time. Yeah. Uh, and and Philip, it's it's the opposite. I, I was checking also here on his Twitter profile that he actually sold the company to uh, Etoro. So. Right. Uh, which is which is a quite a uh, known company, so it's it's really interesting. How did this conversation go of of you two saying like I want to travel? Okay, let's let's also build something together. Yeah. Uh, do, do you remember that those days? Yeah, it was a bit of a combination of elements. So first, um, as you said, Philip had sold his last startup, which mm -hmm. meant he had, and he also left the company at that stage, so he didn't stay on right. board, which meant he had time and we had uh, money. Um, which was, which is, I think, quite important and maybe not not mm -hmm. talked about often enough. Yeah. So we had some some more savings uh, all of a sudden at that time to be able to take more risks. So I think that was like a big one in in taking the decision. Also, we had been working on Hotspot as a side project next to my full time job and. 
the the excitement of like people paying for it and people actually using it really also kind of got to me and made me really you know excited to like right. maybe I want to like what if we do this full time um, yeah. it makes you was curious. it your idea it was actually an idea we had kind of had together in when when we were traveling in Mexico a mm-hmm. couple of years before that um, and we were in Tulum which is like the hotspot mm-hmm. for travel influencers and we were just okay. talking about like because at that time uh, there was a lot of negative publicity about travel influencers and them wanting to have free stays at hotels right. and so we were kind of like talking about that and and just wondering like how does it work for smaller hotel owners who maybe don't get all the attention from influencers and while they might actually be able to use it and um how could we like connect both of them and and it just kind of organically you know it was it was more like a brainstorm mm-hmm. or a dream during our holiday right um and yeah so that's kind of how that started and then we just made well, we actually needed a form um, and because we wanted to check if we could find hotels that would be interested in the ID. Mm-hmm. And we used Google Forms, which I was like a bit frustrated because yeah. it, it doesn't look well and I don't really enjoy using it. So Yeah, it's so we ugly. Ended up, yeah, using <laughs> Compared it. with your product, it's so ugly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we ended up using it because Typeform was also expensive. Um, mm. We were, you know, not earning any money with it. So we ended up making a Google form and just doing like cold outreach to some hotels that we found on Instagram, asking, mm-hmm. would you be interested if we would build this product? And then we said to ourselves, if we find 100, uh, which seemed like a lot for us at the it's time, a lot, yeah. then we build it. And we found 100 quite fast. Wow. So we thought, okay, there's something here. So I guess that kind of validation combined with philip Mm. having time combined with us having some more financial resources and also there was one more thing we also like tested so we went to um lanzarote for two weeks to have like a Uh workation so like how is this traveling and working is it as easy as people say so we also did that um and we did it for two weeks and just we rented like an Airbnb in the morning. So we would work until like four and then we would explore the island. Yeah. And we really, yeah, you know, we really loved that. So, yeah, that's kind of what got us to, to, you know, go all in and, yeah. and try to, to do something together. Yeah. So it was not like it's, an it's, overnight it's a, decision. <laughs> right, right. So it's a whole, a whole process. But yeah, there's also, also here, also quite interesting in my perspective, which is, so Philip was able to sell his company and you have yeah. this nice runway, right? Yeah. And at this point, you are also in like early 30s, right? Yeah. So a lot of people in that in that age start thinking, okay, let's let's build a family, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's kind of the opposite of uh going all in on a startup, right? Like so yeah. you try, okay, <laughs> okay, nice, we have some money, we can we can save it. Uh, and uh, now maybe let's be a little bit more conservative, maybe start a family and see if everything works for first one, two, three years. Yeah. And then maybe then risk it if we, if we feel comfortable. Right. But so was starting a family already part of your mind w- back then? Or is it something just came afterwards? Yeah. We So we both knew we wanted children. So in our... Mm-hmm. So that actually also kind of played a role. We were like, okay, early 30s, if we want to like travel and try out the startup thing, we should do it now, you know, before we start uh, thinking about kids. And that was the whole idea. Now, because of COVID, all of that didn't happen. And we were back at home, um, you know, after literally like one month uh, in lockdown for almost a year. And then we just started thinking like, okay, we can wait, but we don't really know how long this is going to take. And should we like, I mean, things might have gone very differently if we went traveling. Maybe we would have waited a couple of years and and who knows. Um, But that didn't happen. And then when we understood that COVID was also not really going away, we decided not to put like our personal lives on hold for the startup mm-hmm. story. So right. that's kind of how it all came together. But I yeah. would not advise it. Like it's not a competitive advantage to have a small kid and, and run a startup. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I if can you imagine. can do it differently, I would I would. I mean, that's very brave as well. Right? Like were not you worried that okay, 
we are we are having kids and now what if this fails right yeah, what if yeah. we don't have time to do it like yeah w- was going back to to a normal job a possibility um, it was, like how did you rationalize that um i think for us this the thing we said like what's the worst that can happen is that this fails yeah no one thought about a pandemic of course but we can always you know we work in tech we have uh we have experience we can always go back and find a job so w- the worst thing that could happen or the worst case scenario was to find have to find a job and and go back to work as an employee um so that was definitely an option because we had no clue of this Mm. you know thing would work i was definitely scared about combining like the baby with the startup journey and not earning money um that was that was it was definitely there but then again because we had some savings uh from the sale that just kind of helped us to say okay we can last for a year or a bit longer like two years and we'll we'll still be fine uh, if we don't make any money so that definitely helps but it it doesn't really make it less stressful because you live from your savings and you see it go down yes. every month and nothing yes, comes in. I know what it means. Yeah. And that's that's know. that's not fun. Um, of course, COVID helped us because we could not go to restaurants, we could not travel, so we were spending a lot less than we yeah. would usually do. But it it was definitely stressful, and it still is. Uh, with of course the, the 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 change that now we are making money, and after um, a while we could start paying ourselves a salary, and then then the whole situation changes. Uh, of mm. course, how was the reaction of the people around you, like your friends, your family? I don't know. Here in Portugal, for instance, people are still very family family centric. So yeah. I, they, my parents would definitely get nervous. Okay, starting something without having a steady job and starting a family without having a steady job. Is, was it the same for you or did you get support? How was it? I mean, it was difficult. I think people were really afraid <laughs> of what we were doing just yeah. because, especially in Flanders, there's not like the whole entrepreneurial mindset uh, is not really something that we're born with you know so Mm -hmm. people are really risk averse and and try to avoid uh taking to yeah just taking financial risks uh basically so quitting your job and then having a baby would not be like a a a normal thing thing to to do do, or advisable (laughs) thing to do so there was a lot of that like what if you get pregnant what are you gonna do you're not gonna get like um you know, there's like maternity leave and usually yeah. when you, you can stay at home for a while and would still get some money from the government, we didn't get all of that. So that was stressful. Um, also, like you're both in it full time. What, you know? Yes, exactly. What are you going to do when it when it fails? So there was definitely that from family side as well. Um, although, uh, yeah, my parents were like dying to get a grandchild. So I guess yeah. that like overweight... <laughs> the 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 whole situation they were just happy to you know to to get a baby and my sister is quite entrepreneurial she works at media monks like mm-hmm. multinational uh, has a a high position there so she was always supportive of of the idea um, right. so there was a bit of both um but i would say yeah the the a lot of people made us scared instead of um, yeah. supporting us, which which is normal because you know people are like a form builder or travel yeah. influencers. What is that? Is <laughs> Explain that to your to your family. It must be work. hard. Yeah. yeah, you're like there's no office, there's no employees. Yeah, social security, it, unemployment oh, no, fee, yeah, nothing, right? Yeah, no, no, no. How, how do you like? What is your tip to deal with that? With yeah. that fear, like, do you just, like, put it aside? It's like, yeah, let's, okay, let's forget about it and think about tomorrow instead of next year. Yeah. Or, like, what? what is your tips? I think for us, we gave ourselves some time, right? Like, as I said before, like, we, we also knew the first thing might fail. Of course, you don't go in it with that mindset. You, you like, go full on and you really think that your project is going to succeed. But yeah. Just knowing that it might fail and maybe it's the second or the third thing that works out or maybe it's the tenth thing. But to have that mindset, you also need to have the time and having the time means having the money. And that's just something that for us really helped 
is just um, knowing that, okay, we will be able to pay our bills, even if this startup doesn't work out in the coming months. I think that that definitely helped. And also just, we had each other. I think like solo founders, I have a lot of respect for them because I don't know how you do it without like support from someone yeah. who is in the same boat. And I, I guess what also helped with us is that we're partners in life and living together. So yeah. there's only one rent that needs to be paid, right? If, if you're with like two co-founders and True. two families, that's already a different mm -hmm. story. And then there might be other partners getting, you know, stressed out by the situation. Right. So we were mm -hmm. in the same boat. We were supporting each other. And we said, worst thing, we just go back, find a job. And, and that's it, you know, that's, that's also fine. Of course, that was not going to be our dream and we would be disappointed. But um, yeah, that's kind of how it okay. went for us. And, and, then, and then your first approach was a startup in the traveling area, which yeah. failed, right? Yeah. Obviously because of COVID, uh, not necessarily because of, because of you or because of the idea, yeah. but it was just impossible for any startup in that area mm -hmm. because there was no traveling, right? So no. that failed, and then uh, suddenly, I don't know, how, how long did that project, or for, for how long did you work in that project? Six yeah, months? Yeah, so more? I would say it was already like a year uh, on the side, um, as a side project. Okay. Um, and then, um, so I quit my job like in January, February 2020, and then in March, COVID happened and we right. still worked on it for a couple of months because we thought, you know, how long can this take, uh, this pandemic uh -huh. thing? Um, so we thought we'll develop some features, like, you know, just prepare uh, now that we both had yeah. had like full time, you know, resources to do so until the summer. And then by the summer we said, okay, we need to, we need to pivot or do something else right. because there's no way that we can find new clients and grow mm -hmm. this as a very, you know, young startup in this, um, yeah, environment. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. I guess was it then, an easy decision to take? No, no, it was not. Because for me, it was scary. Um, I was already pregnant at the time. So it was okay. also like starting from scratch wow. with no idea if this new thing would you know, work. So we just yeah. knew we did not want anything to do with travel. <laughs> so it had to yeah. be something else. The space that we are in now is also a lot closer to our passion and our previous jobs. Um, you know, it, it's more of a tech audience um, or a product uh, audience mm -hmm. that we are in now. So yeah, I, I think in the end, like not full time, but the project went on for like a year and a half first as a side project and then like six months with both of us working full right. time on it before we decided to to do something else mm -hmm. yeah so you you reach to that decision you're yeah. already pregnant and how did you deal with with it was it like a lot of anxiety back then uh what, what do you remember what what was going on on your mind uh, because I, I can imagine I have I, I also run a community of of uh, of makers, okay. and uh, one of our members now um, she's also pregnant, and what she says as well is that okay I I feel that I also don't have the energy sometimes to work yeah. and and to do and to do things that I need to do right yeah um, was it something that also was worrying you and think okay yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that definitely you... happened. Um, I would be like tired, but then of course we were at home, you know, working from our living mm -hmm. room. Um, so I also could have, uh, you know, naps. I didn't have to go to an office. Also, we didn't launch yet. So I was doing more some like research and Philip okay. started building uh, the MVP. So I think for me at that time, it was actually... Um, better than I would be, you know, an, uh, an employee somewhere. Right. Yes. We didn't have users yet. And of course, there's anxiety like, is this going to work? But it was all so early. Um, so for me, I could actually rest uh, whenever mm. I wanted. Uh, and yeah, um, give you more flexibility, yeah. more flexibility, just, you know, like if you want to sleep one hour during the day, it's fine. And then you work a bit more in yeah. the evening. So I, that that definitely helped. Uh, so for me, that was was quite um I would not say chill, but that that definitely helped in taking things a bit mm. slower. Um, was not as bad as one would expect. No, no, definitely not. Okay. No, I think for okay. me it was easier than than women that you know 
had to go work. to the office okay. or, or work somewhere else. Yeah. yeah so I think else, that yeah. that definitely helped. Mm. Um, but again, also because you know we we gave ourselves some time and we just decided to take things slow and and do it at our own pace. We, you know, we also don't have investors, so we decide yeah. everything ourselves. There's no outside pressure. And mm. when you haven't launched yet, no one also knows what you're doing. So mm. the only pressure is is the one that yeah, you, you put on you, yourself. Exactly. You make your own pressure. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Tell me, how did you have this idea to build a form a form, form builder? Yeah. Like, how did that come to be? Because, you know, you go from the travel industry to suddenly, you know what, let's build a form. Like, how? What's the connection? Yeah. One connection is that we needed forms in our previous jobs and also for hotspots, okay. right? We needed to, right. we made the Google form. So we had already experienced like the problem a bit, like, hmm, isn't there something co cooler than Google forms, but then more expensive or more affordable than type form. Um, so that was like a first like idea, I would say, uh, but that was nothing concrete yet. Also good to know is that like 10 years ago, Philip had once had like this uh, weekend project okay. that he launched on Product Hunt and it was called Tally and it was a tool for polls. So you could really easily make a poll. It was not right. a form builder, but it was something in the same uh, space. And that kind of, mm. that got to like product number one very fast, but he never really did anything with it. So that was like a first um I mean, that just ID kind of came up as well, because we would have brainstorms thinking about what what is this new thing? Like, what are we going to do? Uh, we would just think of ideas so or problems that we've had ourselves. At the same time, we were also using Notion okay. for our own documentation and roadmap and so on. And we really loved the product. So I guess we were just talking and thinking, what if we can have the ease of use and like the sexiness of a product like Notion? combined mm. with just a, a more fun to use form builder, right. you know, uh, and that's kind of, and until Philip was like, oh yeah, I made this tool once. It was called Tally and it was a poll and it was really easy. You didn't have to uh, create an account. You could just go in and, and, and use it. And it did really mm. well on Product Hunt. All of that together kind of made us think of, okay, what if we make a form builder right in the right. beginning we thought that just a form builder would not do it because there's so many right like it's such a competitive exactly. space yeah so we're like how oh, we, we need to do something else um and at the very start we were thinking more of building like a new type of crm to okay. go with it as well because we thought just the form building just the capturing data that's not gonna cut it we need like to give people more insights and more ways right. to like manage the data manage it but then when Philip actually started building, we realized like how much work it is to actually yeah. build a simple form builder. So we said, okay, we'll have to launch with something very basic. And we kind of threw the whole CRM data insights ID overboard. Yeah, which kind of shows as well how important it is to do quick and small releases yeah. instead of yeah. the opposite, right? Because otherwise yeah. a lot of maybe founders without... A lot of experience they'll be like no we need to build this so let's spend a year building this yeah. that is super complex and then they would launch like no one like it and right. the, uh, and for you you actually you build only the form which is already more than enough and that's exactly what what people wanted but tell yeah, me one thing Mary, the, like, the, yeah. the form was not um you could like the very mvp you could not even publish a form so you could just try out the editor and we would share that with people just to see what they what they think. Right. And then only then we added like, you can publish the form and share the form. You could only add like a name and an email address. And so it was very basic. Um, right. But we did make sure that we had like more features uh, for our like official launch. Mm. But I would say that was only like six months later after sharing okay. the basic version and collecting feedback and pimping it and, you know, mm. going forward. Did, did like you that. build with an audience already with a did you try to use the audience first approach yeah i mean we didn't have the audience yet of course when we started so we did uh we had a slack channel and we would just invite everyone in that would want to give feedback so that would be like our very first uh audience but how would you find these people so we would do we would go on product hunt and we would check uh similar tools that had been upvoted by people and then we would just reach out to those people because we figured they might be interested in ours as well. 
and we would make lists of like you reach out to the people that app voted similar tools. the similar tools yeah okay yeah that's, that's super smart yeah so th this is where your marketing experience comes right like you right. you know that you need to reach out to people and it's a lot of like handwork yeah. right so you know go there send it I've tried doing that myself. Like most of the people do not answer. How, how did you get them to answer? Like how does yeah, it work? Yeah, I mean, most of them don't. So we send a lot. I think we send thousands. Twitter or email? Um, mostly Twitter, uh, some, Twitter. some okay. email. So via Product Hunt, I would check their Twitter profile because you cannot send messages on, on Product Hunt as far mm -hmm. as I know. Um, yeah. And then I would DM them if possible. If not, I would look for their email. So it's very... Um, uh, time consuming. I think at one point we like hired a Fiverr, someone on Fiverr to help us just to make the lists, um, just to make it. Which, like by the a, way, this is a great idea. This is a yeah. great. I was just thinking, like, I, we need to build a way to just click and get a list of people from Product Hunt, right? Right. And we kind of we had something like Philip built something very scrappy of like that. Of course he did. <laughs> uh, so we had something okay. like that. Uh, we never like commercialized it, but actually at the time we were also thinking like, wow, this is. Yeah, other people can use this as well. So there's a new startup ID for if, if someone is looking. Yeah, it's um, amazing. I love it. Yeah, so we did that and we did that a lot. And it was very time consuming and it was uh, energy draining because you just don't get a lot of uh, re replies. Yeah. We did make it quite targeted and we would like try to adjust the message. So it would really look like at the yeah. job title of the person and really try to make it personal. So that kind yeah, of lowers so, the volume, but hires the, the response rate. Um, so here is, yeah, I really need to know your opinion on this because you're a, the marketing expert. How to do a proper cold email or cold message? Like, yeah. so you already said a little bit that you have to personalize it. How long should it be? What is the action point? Like, what are the yeah, rules there? I would say I'm not, I'm definitely not an expert in cold outreach. I think what helped for us is that I was the co-founder writing the message. Um, right. And we would make sure that the message is correct. So if it already feels like a cold email, you know, then I'm, I mean, me, I get a lot of cold emails every day. I would just immediately right. delete them. But if it's someone using like, you know, hey, your first name, I saw you're busy with this and that. Um, and I thought you might be interested in our product. And we would just love, you know, we would just love to hear your thoughts on it. So it would not be salesy. It would just be. I respect for you feedback. for mm. the experience that you have in your field. Would right. you spare, like, would you have five minutes to just look at our, at our tool that we're building? And right. I think like the humble approach there definitely helps, you know, like we're, we're asking for five minutes it would be great if we could get some of your time. Because most of those people were like startup founders or people that were, you know, really good at something. I guess that helped uh, for us. Do you immediately send the link to the product or do you first try to get their thing, attention did. and then? No, we okay, were like, right these people don't have time, right? So I don't want to send like multiple messages. So we, we had one super short message, which would basically okay. like, hey, how are you doing? We're building this and we would love to hear your thoughts and just link to the product. And that okay. was it. So it was not long, it was very short. But again, I don't think that's like, there's no like one rule fits all for mm. these things. Um, with Hotspot, it was completely different. We would do sequences of cold emails, like we would send seven or eight of them. We had different versions that we would try out. But wow. that's something I feel like would not, you know, doesn't really apply for Tally because mm -hmm. now we have a more of like a product-led growth uh, model. Um, right. But yeah, that's how we how we would do it. And we got around like, I think 25% kind of replied, which for us was, was huge. That's quite good. It's quite um, good, yeah. Yeah. And it also just meant that there was some interest uh, in it, mm -hmm. uh, of course. And, um, yeah, so that, that helped and that just made us get our first, like, I would say first 100 users or something like that. And you brought all of them to Slack even before the no, product was uh, out. No, we would bring them to the product, um, but on the product, we had a link to Slack, um, and yeah, they could, you could just join it. I mean, it was not a mandatory thing, right. um, but people that would, you know, like to talk to us or have a bit more questions would mm -hmm. end up joining the Slack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What what is the real problem that you are solving? 
that was not being solved already by the competitors? I think it's not it's not like it hasn't been solved before. It's just the way we we have built the product. Um, so, I mean, form builders exist and there's a lot of them. So it's definitely not like a new problem that we've solved. The right. problem that we've experienced is just that we wanted a product that is fun to use. So we didn't want to have like the outdated drag and drop model and we wanted to have like the notion like experience where you can just start typing and build your product with shortcuts yes. that's something we really liked and that we hadn't discovered yet um, and that combined with actually just making the product largely free most of our competitors um, or the bigger players in the market they don't have well they have like a free trial um, or, for example, with Typeform, you can collect 10 responses and then you start paying. And that's something right. that we really, it's like an experience that we really hate. So we thought, okay, we just want to make it free, like unlimited forms, unlimited responses. Right. There's no like annoying paywalls there, but we'll mm. just add one like uh, extra set of features where you can pay if you're a team or you need a bit of more pro features. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't do. Like a lot of people have volume-based pricing. You just mm -hmm. use more, collect more, so you pay more. Yeah. And we kind of like turn that upside down and just said, here's everything for free. But if you want to like remove the logo, um, if you want to customize emails, if you want to work with a team, you know, mm -hmm. typically features that 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 teams uh, or or you know uh, companies would need companies um, B2B, then you yeah. can uh, yeah then you can pay for for tally pro mm -hmm. um so that's so you're um, focusing yeah. initially indie hackers right kind of like bootstrappers yeah. people that don't yeah. have a lot of money and they just want right. to use it and that's your free tier yeah and then your idea is and and then for the pay tier yeah. are there still indie hackers or is already like more companies we definitely have indie hackers and bootstrappers uh, a lot of like no code freelancers um, that then could also turn into smaller agencies so there's there's definitely that we also have an indie hackers discount you know which helps and we're quite known in the space um so we definitely have have paying indie hackers as the product was growing and our audience was growing we would get the attention of a lot more Companies, usually startups, um, so mm. more like SMEs, and they would typically be like the audience that would pay for our product, um, interesting. you know, because they just need a bit of, yeah, different features than... Um, That's so interesting. You target indie hackers for the free tier, but then right. those actually paying are not necessarily indie hackers. Not necessarily, It's like you have different... Yeah. different your different tiers have different target customers, right? Yeah, I mean... Uh, we don't really, so we, we always promote our free tier to everyone. And right. so the idea is that around 3% of all the free users, I mean, that's something that we know now, converts to paying users. So we just promote Tally uh, okay. um, as free because, you know, it is largely free. And then people usually start using it for free and then, you know, can convert to a paying mm -hmm. subscriber. Right. Of course, now there's a lot of companies that come in and immediately subscribe because... They don't want to have the Tally logo, you know, if it's a if it's a bigger company. Plus, we charge twenty nine a month, which for companies is yeah. nothing. It's but nothing. It's usually a no brainer to to upgrade. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So, you you got these users on on Slack and you you built with them. Yeah. Uh, how how did that that process go? So once you're ready to launch. What yeah. were your marketing strategies and how did it grow? Like, do you immediately see, okay, a lot of people are using it um, or or was it slow? Do, do you remember that part? that part? We shared the MVP, it would be like September 2020. And then um, we only launched, so our public launch was on Product Hunt because we figured that's where a lot of people are that, um, you know, that would be uh -huh. interested in the product. In between that, there's like a small six months Um so we made sure that we had more features because we didn't want to launch and then just get the feedback like, ah, but I cannot uh, enter my phone number or I cannot enter this or this. So um, we, we made sure that we had like a set of, of input blocks that we felt like were necessary to mm -hmm. be considered as a, a form builder. Mm -hmm. So we made sure we had those. And then at the meantime, we would also be... Um, 
answering a lot of questions about foreign builders online. So, for example, on Reddit or on Twitter, on Indie Hackers, when everyone, whenever someone would be looking for a foreign builder, I would try to answer and like plug in Tally. Um, so that was like our our second uh, way of of you know. Um, uh-huh. Getting new users. Yeah, users. Um, how how then, did you do that? Like, did you use any tool, or were yeah. you like basically every day going on on indie hackers and checking for people asking for forms? I was using so there's TweetDeck, uh, which you can use to mm-hmm. to scan Twitter, um, and then I was using. Um, I still am using. Um, it's also an indie tool. It's called I think it's a five bot, which you can okay. actually use it for free up to. Um, certain limits and you can just scan for Five keywords bots. interesting okay um, yeah I, I can uh, send it to you if you want to add yeah, it that'd be great. um and you can just um, scan for keywords on different channels um and if you you know you can tweak those and after a while you get good mm-hmm. results and you know uh when to um you know when there's a conversation right. going on where your product might be relevant mm. so then i would share that um but i think the most important part about our growth is that um, Tally is um, is a product that kind of sell, sells itself because it's a viral product. Okay. You know, you make a form and the intention is always to share it with other people because you want other people to respond yes, to it. The marketing, the, that's something yeah. that I've been exploring recently, the, the viral loop, right? Like the right. marketing viral loop. Yeah, how it works is we have on our free tier, we have a made with Tally badge. So everyone who makes so a form smart. Yeah. with the free tier would have that badge. So everyone who replies to the form also sees that badge. Mm-hmm. And on the thank you page, um, they also see this page. Uh, this form was made with Tally, you know, if you want to try it out. And with the link to our product. Yeah. And so once you get that that first set of users um, through cold outreach and and answering conversations online and so on, um, being active in communities. Um, so once we had the first set of users and they started sharing forms, it would just grow because of our yes. own users. And that's kind of how we grow now. Um, so that that's the most important uh, part of um, of our growth, basically. That makes, that, that's so smart. Did, did you do that on purpose? Was this already part of your marketing background that you think, okay, before we launch, we need to find this viral loop. We need to make sure that people see the Tally logo and, and that they know and they get curious about it. Was this already part of your strategy or just happened? It just kind of went with the the nature of having a form builder um, and just it's something that we saw that other form builders are doing as well. Like you have the brand mark and you pay to remove it. So it, it's not some, it's not, we didn't have like before Tally, we didn't have the idea of, oh, it needs to be, this viral uh, product, mm-hmm. not like that. But once we started building it, we just realized like, okay, this will be um, right. the main way to grow it. Um, right. So yeah. it kind of went just hand in hand with the type of, of product. Mm-hmm. So I guess if you're building any type of publishing tool, you can you can use that strategy. But for other type of tools, it might be more difficult. Right, right. right. So you... You got the first free, few users from yeah. from that strategy of forums and answering people, and then once they got into your machine, they the, your viral loop strategy helped grow, expanding and it, grow yeah. and expand and expand. And then at some point, you have this kind of passive marketing tool that you don't have to do anything because by, just by people using it, they are yeah. sharing it with the world, right? Yeah, yeah. How right. how did the, then the the payment part work like? When you launched, were you, did you already have like the payment, the pay, payment features? No. So we, our first goal was we wanted to make something that people would enjoy using, and it was free. So we didn't even have Tally Pro. Um, we didn't have paying features, but we did. We we introduced it after a couple of months, though. We introduced our first like Tally Pro package, and it had. It didn't have a lot of features. I think it just had like removing the branding and also removing a commission if you use the payment right. forms. It was something and people like were that. asking for that or, or is it just like, did you just try it out? People were asking to remove the logo, of course. So that was right. one that we felt like, okay, but this is our biggest marketing channel and we are only a team of two and we don't have the marketing budgets of the big players. So we cannot offer that for free. Um, right. Because that's our growth machine, right? So that should be a paid feature. So that was like a no-brainer to make that paid. And then afterwards, um, we just, we wanted like 
it's still very important for us whenever we launch a new feature that we, our first idea is always to make it free. Um, mm. Unless it's really something that helps bigger businesses or something that costs us a lot of money as well. So there's, for example, you can send emails, uh, automatic emails after your teleforms. If you want to like customize them and send those to more people. Yeah, that's also also a costly feature for us because you know yeah. we need to handle that infrastructure so that's a paid feature it's also not necessarily something you need as a bootstrapper for example um, yes because there's other ways to solve that so that would be one and then i guess one of the the bigger ones is like we have a custom css feature that mm -hmm. basically allows you to change the whole design of the form and when you launch these features how is it? How is the conversion? Do you immediately have people paying for it? Do you still remember that feeling of like, yes, we are making money? I remember our first payer was actually um, James from Indie Bytes from, from the podcast. Yes. Uh -huh. And he started paying, but we didn't have a paying tier yet. So he was like, oh, I love the product. I um, I want to support like, you know, new software. And he just, he, he started paying. So we, we didn't have the whole Stripe set up yet. Yeah. So we just made like this plan for, I don't know, I think it's like $9. We just put something on it. I think, I think he's still on that plan actually. Uh, just <laughs> like, you know, for our first supporter. Uh, so that's how, how it started. Um, I don't remember exactly how fast the conversion was when we introduced uh, Tally Pro. It was mainly after our product hunt launch that we mm. like we doubled our user base there on one so free users on one day. And you can also wow. see in our MRR growth that that was really like the beginning of people converting as right. well. And then, ah, so when you did the launch, you already had the, the possibility of um, asking for money. Yeah, yeah, we did. The, the yeah. premium features. Yeah, yeah, it was already okay. there. Yeah, yeah. How many correct. users did you have before Product Hunt and after? Um, for the exact numbers, I would need to look them up, but I think we had around, did we have a small thousand before? Okay. And it's then already... it would like, or maybe a bit less, and then it would have like doubled after the launch. Yeah. Okay. So you already so had was a, a lot of peak. users. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That was like the okay. first first peak of of growth um, for users and and okay. MRR as well. The other paid features we launched them gradually. It's not like one feature has really like caused like a giant peak. It just it just kind of compounded and um, right. And since then, is how is the growth? Is like just linear, like exponential? Is it always growing and then go or or also kind of fluctuating? I'll, yeah. I'll just, yeah, I mean, year one was or like first six months was like very low, and then after our product hunt launch, it just really you know went up quite fast. But I think in the first year, we we ended the year one with like an MRR of I think eight k. Okay. And so that's year one. And now uh, we finished uh, year two uh, last month uh, with 30K. So, yeah, it wow. is just definitely speeding up um, a lot. And it's, wow. it's just the, the viral loop that is that is doing its work, uh, I would say. Yeah. From this 30K, how much is it profit? Is it like a big percentage is it profit? Yeah, our costs are quite low because running the product is... Um, you know, it's just server costs. And, and I mean, right. those costs are increasing rapidly as our user base is, is growing as well. So I think it's, it's um, yeah, it would be like 70% or something would be a profit. 70, wow. Yeah, so, but um, of course now we're starting to hire as well. And we, we also uh -huh. started paying ourselves salaries in year two. Um, so those things are, are also like kind of in the costs. Uh, so uh -huh. it's mainly salaries and then uh, tools that we use. We don't really do paid advertising yet. Like we're starting with, with first uh -huh. experiments. So there's not really money that went into that. So yeah, it, 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 it was very profitable from the beginning. Wow, it's so exciting. It's so exciting. So now, uh, and, and to kind of fi uh, finish here our, our conversation, how is your life now, right? So <laughs> you, you you have you have a kid and uh, you have the money that uh, I guess your anxiety is a little bit reduced. But I, I'm interested in knowing 
yeah, what is a day in your life and how, how much many hours do you work? I would say less than we would want to because we have like a bit of a daycare crisis in Belgium. There's not enough people to take care of the kids, basically, and she doesn't go okay. to school yet. So we have like daycare from basically nine to five. Uh, which means that we are also kind of stuck into a nine to five time frame during the day. And then usually we would, depending on the plans we have, work a bit in the evening, you know, when our daughter goes right. to bed. And in the weekend when she does a nap, you know, we would probably also be working. So it's not like we work day and night because we just cannot and we don't have the energy for that. But we are still in a, this constant struggle of how can we organize our household and family so we can yeah. be more productive and work more in the end we also just had to admit that you know our lives have changed and um, right. it will be difficult to to work a lot more so we also had to expand the team and that's mm -hmm. why we hired our okay. first customer support person uh last week actually who's part-time now helping us out with uh -huh. answering slack messages and emails We waited a bit too long with that, I would say, because our day would look like, you know, we would get up day at seven, make the make our daughter ready, bring her to a kindergarten, and then mm -hmm. um, work like, I would say, from from eight ish, eight thirty to like five when we need to pick her up again, and half of the day would be answering emails and support questions. Right. So that only left like a couple of hours a day to really build new features or work right. on marketing projects. And that was way too little. Like we were just getting too stressed about that because the mm. audience is growing and there was, you know, we're getting a lot more questions on a daily basis. Yeah. So we just decided that we, you know, cannot keep up with the pace. Interesting. Uh, and that's why we chose to, to have help on the, like the customer support front mm -hmm. to start with. And it, it's week one, uh, but it's already, you know, giving us a lot more headspace and, I can imagine, and um, yeah. a bit more uh, uh, time to just focus on, uh -huh. on growing and, and selling the product. Yeah. 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 Did having a baby, was it something that changed your approach to the way that you make business that actually helped? That maybe without having the baby, you'd be like, no, I wouldn't do like that way. Like, did you become more productive or something that actually pos uh, like positive for something the Something positive, yeah. No, yeah, this sounds yeah, really no, wrong. But I, I get understand. it, yeah. I, I, and, and I totally get it. I think what's, what's good about it is that she like time box, like she make, you know, she makes sure that you have a limited time during the day, but right. that also... You know, you have to be productive during those hours. So you have to set priorities and you have to say no to a lot of things. So we, for example, I mean, except for interviews and, and podcasts, we don't do calls. So if someone asks, like, can we help on a quick call? 99% of times we will say no, because we just right. don't have the time for that. Like during those hours, those, those need to be really productive working hours and everything you do within those hours need to help in some way to to you know grow mm -hmm. tally so i think that really helped with focus and setting priorities and mm -hmm. postponing things that are not that important yet bootstrapping things just you know doing stuff instead of thinking more strategically of course right. after a while that kind of turns against you because then you feel like okay we're we're just stuck in the day to day and, and we don't really have a, a vision about how should we grow it. So that's why yeah. we now are growing the team. So we have a bit more headspace to do that. But right. so it helped to just focus. And it also helped for us to not think about work once in a while because yes. yeah. she's there and, you know, you just cannot talk about, course, about work all the time. And especially as a couple that helps us to you know, uh, set some yeah. boundaries. Yeah. How, how is your, also your personal life? Like, do you, do you go on, on dates or do you go with your friends? Like, or is it like yeah. baby work, baby work? We try to have, uh, you know, something fun outside of, of work uh, as well. So how we see it is we work together, we live together. So we're like always together. So during the week, we make sure that we do separate things. So in the evening, you know, Philip would go for drinks with his friends or, And then I would be home uh, and I could, you know, work a bit more and, you know, babysit or, or yeah. the other way. We each Smart. have like yeah. um, 
you know, Philip has a, this bouldering, I do Pilates, like we each have like our hobby yeah. and our friends. So we try to do those during weeknights, I would say. And then in the weekends, we would mostly be together as a, as a family and uh, mm. do things with our daughter. And Philip is from Bulgaria. So we, we live in Belgium right now, mm -hmm. but we also travel to his family uh, once right. in a while. We'd like to travel a bit more uh, next year. Um, so we'll yeah. see how that goes because yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, traveling uh -huh. and working is is also not that that easy with the kids. Uh, but yeah, that that's kind of how our uh, private lives look like. Great tips, great tips for for also um, indie indie parents, right? I, I love yeah. the idea also on, on like separate a little bit also your your time to have like me time as well. I yeah. think that's also really really important. Last question: Where do you see yourself? Like, in in five years where, where do you see the business and, and you and your family and all of that i mean we're definitely in like with tally we're in it for the long run we we decided that we want to stay bootstrapped so uh i mean never say never but i i think we won't be raising money and i hope we can continue to grow organically mm -hmm. and also grow the team uh so i i think that the, the goal would be to make ourselves a bit less uh important within the company and um uh you know make sure that if if uh, that someone else can replace us basically okay. yeah if we can build a sustainable lifestyle business for our family that's that's kind of right. the goal do you want to work less and and have enough money to like sustain yourself and sustain your lifestyle or you see yourself like i want to build more stuff i want to work more I, yeah i mean hard to say we we I don't see ourselves like not working. That's also not something that would be possible in the in the near future. Um, but what we would love to do at one point is to be able to share our experience with other startups and and you know maybe invest in other startups if we would ever have the funds. I think that would be like the dream. In in these startups? Yeah, I think can be can be anything, but indie would be would be quite cool to do. And it, it kind of depends what happens with, with Tali. I mean, I guess as in any SaaS at one point, um, you, would, you would be interested in selling the product. Uh, right. But I don't think that's something that will, happen, that will be for the coming years. Okay. But if that happens one day and that gives us, you know, the budget to maybe try something new or to invest in other startups, then uh, I think that, mm -hmm. that, would be, that would be the dream uh, for us. Yeah. Thank you so much, Marie. I think uh, it was so, so interesting to to get to know you and to get to know your mindset. And uh, um, I think you are definitely an inspiration as well for uh, for a lot of indie parents. There's a lot of them out there that think that uh, maybe having children is, is is goes against building a product. And you just are, you are the example that it's not true that you can have both. And uh, yeah, true inspiration and have a great product. So. Thank you so much for sharing your um, your experience here with the Wannabe Entrepreneurs. Thank you so much for having me. It was really nice chatting to you. And this was my conversation with Marie. If you want to know more about her and her company, make sure to check out the show notes of this episode. I will link her Twitter and the tally form and everything below. If you are a first time listener, hey, my name is Tiago and this is the podcast about what's really like to bootstrap a company. I have a lot of interviews with other makers and I've been also narrating my journey for more than a year now and uh, I'm very open about the good stuff and the bad stuff too. We are learning together, building in public here with this podcast. There's a lot of episodes for you to check out and uh, everything will be in the show notes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. So just browse through the catalog, check out the title that uh, appeals the most and start listening to another WB episode. Besides that, if you liked this one, make sure to share with all your indie hacker friends and send me a message on Twitter at WBETiago. This was another wannabe entrepreneur. See you next time.